Hi, my name is Frank, and today I'm going to be presenting Bundler, which is a new system we've built for enabling traffic control between different sites across the internet. So what do I mean by that? Well, first, by a site, I'm broadly referring to any single physical location where there's many endpoints sharing the same access link to the internet. So some common examples of this would be a university campus network like MIT, a company office network, or even a particular data center from a cloud provider like Amazon's US West data center. So let's start with this company office network as a motivating example. Imagine you are the network administrator for this company, and there's a lot of different people and applications using the network, each with different requirements. So there's SSH traffic and interactive web browsing that need low latency. There's cloud storage and backups that need high throughput. And there's video streaming and Zoom calls, which need a mix of both. And a common problem you might encounter here is that every time Bob runs a backup session, Alice's SSH traffic starts lagging or her Zoom calls get choppy. So what might be going on here? Well, as everything is shifted to the cloud, all of these different applications typically have an endpoint in one of just a few sites. So either a data center from one of these major cloud providers like Amazon or Google, or maybe another site from the same company. So it's possible that Alice's SSH traffic is going to an EC2 machine and that her Zoom call and Bob's backup are also hosted in the same Amazon data center. Now, if these connections are going to the same destination site, even if it's different physical machines within that site, then they likely take the same path to the network and thus share the same bottleneck as well. And if that's the case, then wherever this bottleneck is, the queue probably looks something like this. So the backup has plenty of packets to fully occupy the queue and the latency sensitive applications are always stuck waiting behind it. Now as the network manager, if you saw this situation, the natural solution would be to implement some sort of scheduling policy. So for example, your policy here might be to give highest priority to Zoom calls and SSH and then only send backup traffic when there's no other packets waiting. So this sort of scheduling is what we mean by traffic control. Now, if this bottleneck is occurring somewhere within your own network, you could just stick a scheduler here and call it a day. But a lot of recent work has shown that today, bottlenecks are often somewhere beyond our network's edge, for example, at a slow or congested interdomain link. And if that's the case, then the queue will actually build at this bottleneck in the middle of the network instead, meaning the queue back at our site will be relatively empty. And if it's empty, then there's no packets for us to schedule. So putting a scheduler here isn't going to really do anything. Now, naturally, you might wonder, um, why not just have scheduling in the middle of the network if that's where bottlenecks occur frequently? Well, first of all, many people share the public internet, and there isn't a one-size-fits-all scheduling policy. So each site might have a different set of traffic they want to prioritize or deprioritize. And this traffic is traveling between many different parties along the network path, different ISPs and autonomous systems, and the bottleneck could occur anywhere. So it might be at this one in the middle, but it could be at this link, at this link, right? So to ensure that your scheduling policy is always enforced, you'd have to coordinate with every possible provider along the path and convince them to apply your policy. So let's take a step back here um, for a second and summarize the problem so far. You have a bunch of traffic going between your site and another site, and you'd like to enforce some policy about how that traffic should share the limited network resources. But no one in the middle of the network can implement that policy for you, it really makes the most sense for you to implement it yourself since you know your own traffic best. But when the bottleneck is outside of your network, you don't have a queue to schedule. So what can you do? Well, if we need packets in our queue to schedule, but they only build up at a bottleneck, then one thing we could do is artificially create a bottleneck within our own site by putting our traffic through a rate limiter. As long as we choose a rate that's less than the real bottleneck, our rate limiter will become the bottleneck. And as a result, our traffic's packets that would have queued at the real bottleneck shift and queue at our rate limiter instead. So now that we have packets in our queue, we can implement scheduling, but how do we pick the right rate? To make this more concrete, um, let's just put some numbers here as an example. So suppose the bottleneck link is 10 megabits per second and our company's uplink to the internet is something much higher than that. Now, if we rate limit to anything less than 10, we will build a queue, but we'll waste bandwidth because the network could have supported up to 10. If we send anything more than 10, we won't build a queue at all, so we'll be right back where we started, unable to schedule. So to maximize throughput and build a queue at the same time, we want to send at exactly 10. But of course, life isn't so simple. We don't really know that the bottleneck is 10, and it's not static. It's going to be changing constantly as network conditions evolve. So imagine, for example, that there's some other traffic sharing this link that averages about 5 megabits per second. Now if we keep sending at 10, our packets will go back to queuing in the middle of the network. So 
In this scenario, we actually need to send it five in order to maximize throughput and still build a queue within our own site. So this sort of seems like a dead end. How can we possibly know the right rate given all of these different possible scenarios? Well, if you tilt your head a little bit, this is actually a very familiar problem, right? Determining the available bandwidth in the network at any given time is exactly what congestion control aims to do. And this is the key idea behind Bundler. So Bundler is just a middle box that sits at the edge of a site. And internally, it has two components. There's a send box that observes all of the site's egress traffic and a receive box that observes all of its ingress traffic. And then the send box groups traffic by its destination site. So it treats all flows going to the same destination site as a single aggregate stream of packets, which we call a bundle. So this set of traffic going to the Amazon data center we've been looking at so far would be one example of a bundle. But we might also have another bundle for all the traffic going to Google, and then another one for all the traffic going to uh, Dropbox, and so on. And then the sendbox over operates over each of these bundles independently, shifting any queues that they would have built in the middle of the network back to the bundler itself. So let's take a closer look inside the sandbox to see how this works. For each bundle, the receive box is responsible for sending some feedback back to the sandbox so that it can compute measurements about the network conditions for the bundle. So this is things like the RTT and the receive rate. And then it feeds these to a congestion control algorithm. This algorithm picks an aggregate rate for the entire bundle that will cause queues to shift without sacrificing on throughput. And then the scheduling policy decides how that aggregate throughput is distributed among the flows in the bundle. So the key component of Bundler's design is how it computes these measurements for congestion control. <clears throat> While there's many ways we could compute the measurements, the contribution of Bundler's scheme is that it's lightweight and transparent. And what I mean by that is both the send and receive boxes forward traffic along without modifying the packets or disrupting the connections. To compute the measurements, the send box periodic periodically samples packets to measure, and then the receive box sends feedback for these packets out of band from the data packets. Now I describe how this scheme works in detail in the longer version of this talk, but for now, I'll just present the key idea. Instead of the send box explicitly communicating which packets it wants to sample, which would require some sort of packet modification, both boxes use the same hashing scheme that lets them independently pick the same packets to sample at random. Compared to some alternative ways of implementing these signals, for example, using a TCP proxy, which would terminate the end-to-end -end connections and send the packets over its own pool of connections, our scheme has a number of benefits. So first, it requires significantly less overhead and complexity. We only need to maintain state and add feedback on the order of one packet per RTT, rather than all in-flight packets. And second, the data path functionality is far simpler. We only need to compute a single hash per packet in the data path, and the control functionality executes off the data path. In contrast, a TCP proxy needs to implement reliability in the data path. Now, the other key idea behind Bundler that I want to highlight is that shifting the queues is not possible in all scenarios. When the network looks as I described it at the beginning, everything works fine. But the internet is complex and messy, and to be fair, these conditions may not always hold. So in particular, there's two potential scenarios that Bundler needs to handle. First, we assume that all flows in a bundle share the same bottleneck in the network, but they might not, for example, if the bottleneck is using ECMP. And if they don't, then they won't be competing with each other, and it doesn't make sense to schedule them together. Second, it's only possible for a bundler to shift its queue if it's not sharing the bottleneck with any long-lasting buffer-filling cross-traffic. In the presence of such traffic, if bundler tries to operate as normal, it will significantly lose out on throughput, which would outweigh any potential scheduling benefits. Now, although we can't do anything to prevent these conditions from happening, we can actually reliably detect them, and we can do it using the same measurements that we collected for the congestion control scheme. So this actually presents a fourth benefit for our architecture. Because it's transparent to the underlying traffic, we can disable Bundler temporarily when the conditions are unfavorable, and then we can re-enable it as soon as these conditions disappear. This ensures that even in the worst case, Bundler will never hurt its traffic's performance. But of course, Bundler is only useful if it's not disabled often. While no measurement study would be sufficient to make any definitive statements about the internet at large, I can confidently say that in all the experiments we've run in our group across a number of different projects, these conditions are rare. So we really believe that in most cases, Bundler will be able to provide useful benefits. And if this seems surprising to you, then please do check out the longer version of this talk or the paper where we're able to explain this reasoning in a bit more detail. Now, finally, I wanna show you a single controlled emulation experiment that demonstrates the type of improvements Bundler can provide. 
For this experiment, we created a situation like I talked about at the beginning. So there's a variety of traffic between two sites that's competing at a bottleneck in the middle of the network. And this bottleneck is outside the sender's control, so it can't enforce a scheduler here. To emulate a realistic set of traffic, we generated flow sizes according to a distribution that Kaida observed in an internet backbone router. So this is representative of what you might expect to see in the middle of the network. And just to give you an idea of what this distribution looks like, the vast majority of flows, 97.6% were small, less than 10 kilobytes each, and then about 2% were medium, and about a tenth of a percent were large flows. And then we looked at the distribution of flow completion times separated into the three different traffic sizes. And what I'm actually plotting here, the slowdown, is really just the FCT normalized by the size of the flow. Now, if we look at the results here, this case is our baseline. Since we're not running Bundler, it's representative of the status quo you'd expect to see today. And the main thing I want to point out here is that the short flows, which should be able to complete in a single RTT, are taking almost twice as long at the median and more than four times as long at the tail. Now, the ideal solution in this case would be to have a scheduler right at the router where the bottleneck is occurring. As I mentioned earlier, it wouldn't make sense to do this in practice, but it does give us a reference for the optimal benefit a scheduler pr could provide here. So we added the scheduler, and we configured it to use a fair queuing policy to prevent short flows from waiting behind longer ones. Now, all the flows tend to complete faster, both at the median and the tail. But in particular, all the short flows are able to complete pretty much as quickly as possible. So with these as reference points, finally, we removed the scheduler and instead enabled Bundler at both sites. And we configured it to use the exact same fair queuing policy. What we can see here is that relative to the status quo, Bundler is able to reduce the slowdown of all flows across the board. And if we look at the short flows, which are the ones we're really trying to help most by using FQ, the median slowdown is close to optimal, and the tail slowdown is reduced by more than half compared to the status quo. So to summarize, Bundler is a new middle box that enables scheduling regardless of where congestion occurs in the network. It has a simple, lightweight, and transparent design, so it's realistic to consider deploying in today's networks. All of our source code and evaluation scripts are available on our GitHub, and we've worked hard to make it easy to reproduce all of our results. So please give it a try, and let us know if you have any questions or issues. Thanks for listening.